Welcome to another episode of Today in Radio History. Today we spotlight an episode from Cabin B-13, which was originally broadcast today, July 5th, 1948. Like and subscribe to us below and click that bell to receive notifications on all of our new video uploads. The Cabin B-13 radio series was broadcast on CBS from July 5th, 1948 to January 2nd, 1949. It went on the air as a replacement for Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts and was replaced by It Pays to Be Ignorant. Now you can download your own digitally enhanced, noise-reduced version of today's episode and many more of your favorite radio episodes by clicking on the links below. Watch our video on how we clean up old audio files and visit us online at radiolongago.com. Today's episode, Bill and Brenda Leslie, originally aired on this date, July 5th, 1948. Today in Radio History presents Cabin B-13. My name is Fabian, ship surgeon of the luxury liner Mauravania. Tonight, as we lie alongside the docks at the great port of Southampton, the ship is ghostly, deserted. Our passengers on this world cruise have gone to London. And as I sit here in my cabin... B-13. I'm reminded how the tides and storms of a thousand voyages have wrought nothing more strange, more sinister than man's desire for adventure in the strange ports and lands we touch. I remember Bill and Brenda Leslie. It was years ago before the war and the effect on their characters of the mortal terror that overtook them in London. CBS brings you John Dixon Carr's famous Dr. Fabian, ship surgeon, world traveler, and host in Cabin B-13 for strange and incredible tales of mystery and murder, directed by John Dietz. London and Hamden's Hotel in Norfolk Street off the Strand. A quiet little street sloping down to the river. Quiet little hotel. So dingy with its stuffiness of old carpets and yesterday's tea trays, it should never suspect how fashionable it is. Or how expensive. Can't you hear the lift whining as its two latest arrivals, the husband American and the wife English, go swaying up to a bumpy stop? This way, sir. Come on, Brenda. Will there be anything else, sir? Uh, that's all, thanks. Oh, wait a minute. Here. Oh, thank you, sir. Bill, darling, please don't look so bewildered. Was I looking bewildered? I know the furniture's red plush and dates back to the 1860s. I know we can't get a private bathroom. By George, the waiters look as old as the furniture. But if only we'd gone to Claridge's or the Savoy or any one of a dozen places I suggested. But darling, you don't understand. No? Who the devil wants to go to Claridge's or the Savoy? This is London. Oh, Bill. I'm afraid I still don't understand. I've been in the diplomatic service for seven years. I've been stationed in three capitals. But I've never been here. It's a lovely old town. Oh, it's home. Uh, it's home to me, too, in a way. It's put a spell on my imagination ever since I was a boy so high. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Fu Manchu, handsome cabs rattling through the fog. Darling, you don't think we still ride about in handsomes? No, but it's the spirit of the thing. Here, look out of this window. Yes? Gray and black buildings. Twilight coming down. And yes, look down there. Where? I don't see anything. It's one of your famous barrel organs. Here, let's have the window up. It's under our windows, Brenda. What's the tune, dear? Do you know it? Oh, something about she was a lassie from Lancashire. <laughs> it's a very old one. But it's right, don't you see? 
everything's right. And if I crane out of the window sideways like this, I can see down to the river. That's where the bodies fall off walls and the police launchers go out. Oh, Bill, please listen to me. Yeah. Put your arms around me. Oh. Look down at me. There. <laughs> I have a funny face. <laughs> I admit I have a funny face. I love you terribly, Bill. Mm-hmm. I don't mean any words like very much or a lot. Just silly and terribly. But of all the romantic Americans I've ever met, you have the most absurd and fantastic ideas about England. You don't really expect to find Scotland Yard men in bowler hats trailing you every step. Now, do you? That wasn't the point, Brenda. I only When you said think that... about it, just remember the barrel organ. Safe, stodgy, comfortable. That's London, Bill. Will you remember? Well, at least they've got telephones in this place. Hello? Mr. William Leslie? Yes, yeah, speaking. This is the reception desk, Mr. Leslie. Uh, there's a, a, a man here who insists on seeing you. In fact, the man is on his way upstairs. Uh, he's a police officer. Uh, what did you say? A police officer, sir. A police officer, huh? I see. Uh, he isn't by any chance from Scotland Yard. Yes, sir. I thought you might like to know. Did you hear that, Brenda? Yes, I heard it, but surely... About six hours in England Oh, this is ridiculous, Bill. There must be some mistake. Well, there probably is. All the same, come to think of it, I don't feel very keen about facing one of these bowler hats in real life. But why do they come to us? We haven't done anything. Nothing I can think of. That's what worries me. Get ready for the hat and the raincoat and the cropped mustache. Yes? Mr. Leslie... Mrs. Leslie? That's right. Won't you come in? Thank you. Sorry to have to trouble you, sir. I'm a police officer. Metropolitan CID. Here's my warrant card. I see. Chief Inspector... Radford, sir. And I'm bound to tell you I'm here about a pretty serious matter. But we haven't done anything to... Easy, Brenda, easy. Sit down, Inspector. Thank you, sir. Now, don't mind my notebook. It's a mere formality. You and your wife arrived this morning by the Mauravania. Your wife is British and carries her own passport, correct? Yes, that's correct. A week from today, you leave by the same ship for Lisbon. At Lisbon, you take up a new diplomatic assignment at the American Embassy. Correct? Yes, Yes, just just one moment. I'd like you to look at this snapshot I have here. Who is it? But it's Bill. I, I mean, well, except for that awful shirt and tie... It is, Bill. So help me, I never had that picture taken. I know you didn't, Mr. Leslie. That's Flash Morgan. Ever hear of him? Never. Is he wanted for something? He's wanted for several murders. We won't mention bank robbery. Also, he's a ripper, if you know what that means. Uses a razor and likes it. Me? The image of a famous murderer? They don't look so different from the rest of us. Do you realize, sir, you can't leave this hotel without being nabbed as Morgan by the first copper you meet? But I can prove who I am. I've got my papers. You've got your papers. Right. Suppose Morgan gets them. Morgan? The Moravania sails a week from today. Somebody called William Leslie, carrying diplomatic immunity, sails with her. What's to prove it's really you? You mean he might... I do. Oh, that's impossible. He couldn't get away with it. No, I don't think he could, but I'll give you ten to one. He tries it. This is too small a country to hide in, and he can't get away. He's desperate. This is his last hope. What about Brenda here? There are several things that might happen to Mrs. Leslie. All unpleasant. There's just one more matter I'm bound to warn you of. You've warned us, Inspector Radford. We we appreciate it most awfully. What else could there be? Morgan may try to get into this hotel. Safe, stodgy, comfortable. I see what you mean, Brenda. I beg your pardon, sir? Oh, just a little joke between my wife and myself. It's getting chilly. Better close the window. Now look here, Inspector. This um, ripper, or whatever he is, couldn't possibly know there's a man who looks just like him. He couldn't, eh? Have you seen any evening paper? No. Some fool took a picture of you getting off the boat train. It's been published with comments on the resemblance. You'll find Morgan's story also with pictures on the front page. 
Here's the standard. Read it. But haven't you got any idea where this man is? No, madam, we haven't. He used to have a hangout at 96 Fleet Street up over a barber shop. But he won't go there now. He's loaded with money from the Whitehall Bank job. He's got a razor. And he's ready to use it. Now, if you'll excuse me... Uh, I... Inspector, wait. What do you want us to do? I want you to stay in this hotel, both of you. Until that boat sails. Cooped up here for a week, just on a theory of yours? Yes, Mr. Leslie. Just on a theory. Suppose I do go out. I can't stop you, sir. The guard I'm leaving here can't stop you. But I might send you some photographs of people with their throats cut. Sorry to have upset you. Good day. Hardly any change yet in the purplish-white tinge of early evening. No street lamps are light. But a thin mist, white with late October chill, is creeping up from the river as Bill and Brenda Leslie still sit in the red plush room, staring at nothingness. Brenda? Yes, dear? What was the number of that address Radford gave us where Morgan used to hang out? I don't remember. 96, wasn't it? 96 Fleet Street? Why do you want to know? Because I'm going there. And I'm going now. Yes, I thought that was it. Bill, you can't. You mustn't. You can't do anything there. I know. Then why go at all? Sweetheart, you know what our life is. It's a wonderful life. Oh, with you, yes, every minute of it. But the diplomatic service. Vous allez bien, Madame la Comtesse? I am sure, Signor, that the Rio Alta Bridge will be a great success. Who precedes whom at dinner? Does the young boy's wife eat artichokes? Look, Brenner, suppose I captured Morgan before the police do. Bill, are you absolutely mad? No, no, darling. Once or twice in every man's life, something taps him on the shoulder and says, Come on, I dare you. Mostly we turn away and pretend we don't notice. But not this time. I'm taking the dare. Bill, come back here. You're not to go. Where's my overcoat? I've got it. Now, this address... If you go, I'm going with you. Oh, no, no. This isn't a woman's kind of dare, and you know it. It's as much my dare as it is yours. 96 Fleet Street, up over a barbershop. How do I get there? I... uh, If you don't tell me, Brenda, I can easily find out. Oh. Well, as a matter of fact, it's... It's not very far from here. You could walk it in ten minutes. That's better. That's much better. What about your identification papers? I'm throwing them out here on the bed. Morgan will get those. But if you haven't got those papers, you won't be able to prove who you are. I'll have to risk it, Brenda. See you later. Bill, come back. If you had any reason for going there, I wouldn't mind. But it's idiotic. Don't leave me. Please come back. Please. I'll be with you, Bill. I'll be with you if Morgan doesn't see me first. Footsteps. Slow moving footsteps. Footsteps on gritty pavement where, beyond Temple Bar, Fleet Street curves down into dimness. A dead street, hushed and shadowy, with St. Paul's like a gray cloud far ahead. Too late for office workers, too early for newspaper offices. Let's be Leslie on the left hand pavement. I can tell you, believe me, every half-thought that tumbles through his brain as he walks. Can't see the numbers at the trouble. Fool stun, I wish I hadn't tried it. I can't turn back now, I seem afraid. What if something jumped out of one of these doorways? He's a ripper, if you know what that means. Are you absolutely mad? Mustn't remember things like that. Fleet Street. Dr. Johnson, 18th century. No people around. The street lamp's lighted. Good thing. I'd walk a little faster. No harm in walking a little faster. There. Number 34. Even on the number side of the street, too. I can't be far off now. Mist rising and as cold as... Is that a policeman's helmet? Behind me, up against the sky. Doesn't matter. Police mean safety. If you haven't got those papers, you won't be able to prove who you are.
still doesn't matter. Nobody can see my face. Another policeman's helmet. Swear to it, over in that alley. A little faster. Take it easy now. Don't run. They can't possibly... You there! Stop! Wait a minute! Mustn't get panicky. How do you stop panic? Got to find that address. Got to justify myself. Got to... Run! Run! Ninety-six. Little entry. No door. Flight of steps. Easy on the jump now. Run up quiet as you can. Door with glass panel. Henry M. Jenkins, Bob. Door open and... A large room, perhaps not too clean, with a cork floor giving back no sound. Facing you, a window. On your left, another door. On your right, a wall of mirrors with two white barber chairs. This is what Bill Leslie sees amid a gleam of mirrors and a thick odor of hair tonic. On a white stool sits a little old man with yellow-white hair and a reddish nose, peering up from a paper with cockney friendliness. Why, I beg your pardon. I didn't mean to crash in like this. Not a bit of it, sir. Nobody here, sir. Glad to have you come up any way you like. I've uh, come about something important. Oh, I, I want to shave, please. And I'll just close this door. Shave, sir? Very good, sir. If you'll uh, just come over to you. Uh, that's it. Your overcoat, sir. Allow me. Oh, thanks. And uh, in this chair, please. Now, we'll just whip out the cloth and round your neck it goes. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Don't tilt me backwards yet. Are you... Mr. Jenkins? <laughs> and now that, sir, is what I call a real honor. What's so funny about it? Sorry, sir, it's only a joke. My name is Jenkins, and that's a fact. But mostly the gentlemen call me Old Scratch. Old Scratch? Oh, uh, not in a religious way. Lummy, I should sure hope not. With me, a chapel goer for 40 years, and a teetotaler so's me hand wouldn't shake. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Mix the lobby. No, sir, it's only a joke. If they call me old Scratch, or as it might be old Nick, it's because they know I won't nick them. <laughs> Never miss with a razor, I don't. <laughs> there, now. Now, we just tip the chair back. And I'll bet this lather I'm putting on is as comfortable... Uh, well, is going home to tea and kippers on a night like this. It's remarkable, sir, how oh, come to death. Uh, here, sir. Uh, what is it? What's wrong? I was trying to signal you, that's all. Hey? Keep on lathering. Don't speak any louder than I do. What is it, sir? What's up? Flash Morgan has just come in. Who? Flash Morgan. But there's... Quiet. There's nobody here but you and me. Lift your head up and look. You didn't see him. You were looking at the shaving mug. I saw him come in by the door from the stairs when you moved the chair. You're sure you don't know who Morgan is? Well, help me, Harry, I don't. He's a killer. What about the police? The police? Here, now. Oh, Finish here. with the leather. Then start shaving. But make it quick. Get a razor. Yes, sir. But uh, that's it. Where's the bloke? Is he a blooming ghost? He didn't look at either of us. He didn't make a sound. I saw him in the mirror. He bolted the glass panel door on the inside. Look over and see if it isn't bolted. Uh, yes, sir, it's bolted. He walked to a door at the back of this room, behind me. Can you see it? Yes, sir, of course I can see it. Where does that door lead? Upstairs? No, sir, there's no upstairs on this side of the house. But there's got to be. Morgan lived... I had some friends don't, who... Don't move your chin like that. Keep your head where I put it. If you was looking for 96 proper, you must have seen the numbers in a bad light. Oh? That's under the arch and round the back, like a lot of these old houses. This is 96B. And where does the door lead? Only to a cupboard, sir. A big cupboard. <clears throat> Somebody's hiding there now. That's right. Morgan's there with his razor. Uh, that's the end of the shave, sir. I trust it's satisfactory. Hot towel, sir. Uh, yes, thanks. Hot and steaming. 
Hang on to your nerve, old scratch. We'll get him in two minutes. Uh, uh, towel satisfactory, sir. Oh, I'm a peaceful man, Governor. Oh, I don't want no trouble. Now listen. When you take the towel off, go to the shelf under the mirrors and mess around with the bottles. Ask me if I'd like some kind of lotion and edge toward the glass door. When you get near it, run like blazes and yell for the police. The whole neighborhood's full of cops. Morgan will come out fighting when he hears you run. I'll pick up that high stool and try to hold him off. The cops didn't find me because they went to the wrong 96. Mr. That door beyond you. Well? The knob's moving. Then we'll have to do it when I count three. I can't, sir. I just ain't up to... You can run, can't you? One, two, three... Let us stay where you are, both of you. Oh, well, well. Do I hear in... Chief Inspector Radford? You do? Sorry to break the glass door, old scratch, but it seemed to be bolted on the inside. Yes, it is. In you go, boys. We may right, need several men here. Well, yes. Inspector, don't you recognize me? I'm Bill Leslie. Yes, you probably are. Where's Morgan? He's in that cupboard over there. I don't want to handle him. Have your men got guns? We don't carry guns. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Go over and guard that window. Davis, you stay here. I'll take the wasp out of his nest. Right, sir. Coming out, Morgan? No? All right, have it your own way. I'm turning the knob and... Lord, Lord Almighty. Uh, find that blood, sir. It's Morgan, all right. Uh, but he won't give any trouble now. His throat's been cut. His throat's cut? But who... Who... Curse it, Mr. Leslie. Why do you have to go and kill him? <laughs> It was a famous building on the Thames Embankment. Once red brick with white trimming. Now smoke darkened, redolent of old stone. Inside it looks rather like a hospital, does New Scotland Yard. Not far away down the misty river, there's a great clock. As three persons sit in a small official room. Mr. Leslie... Why don't you tell us the truth? Inspector, I have told you the truth. So is old Scratch here. Ah, every word of it. Let's face it, Mr. Leslie. You killed Morgan, and you don't seem to understand the law here. How do you mean? To kill a wanted man, even a murderer, is just as serious an offense as killing the prime minister. I can't help you if you say you didn't kill him. But I can get you off scot-free if you admit you did it in self-defense. Look, Inspector. I never set eyes on Morgan except when he walked through that shop. Scratch never saw him at all. I never stirred out of the chair for one second. Scratch never left me. Never even took his hands off me for a second. Neither of us did it. Then who killed Morgan? I don't know. The door was bolted on the inside. The window was locked. How could anyone get in? I just don't know. You don't think a ghost got in and killed him? Well, what do you think happened? I know what happened. Oh? Oh, yes. You rather thought you and Morgan would try to corner each other. You were both in Fleet Street within 20 yards of each other when those police whistles blew. And you lost both of us. What happened in the meantime? You and Morgan met at the barber's. There was a fight and you killed him unintentionally. I killed him with what? With his own razor. We found it in the cupboard. Then you bribed old Scratch to keep his mouth shut. Here now, Inspector. Easy, Scratch. Stop rocking back and forth. <laughs> I'd like to tangle up me hair and pull it out by the roots. Oh, I'd like to stand on the track with a engine coming. Oh, I'd like to... Lummy, ain't there any justice? Morgan was loaded with money, carried a thousand quid in an oilskin tobacco pouch. It wasn't on his body. If you gave it to Scratch and Scratch hid it in the confusion after we broke in... You know, Inspector, I've been wrong about this whole thing. Oh, that's better. Oh, another way you mean. I thought my big trouble would be to prove my identity. But you don't doubt my identity. Or do you? I don't know. But officially, until your wife identifies you... That's what I've been asking all night, and you won't answer. Where is Brenda? Well, sir, the fact you is... You haven't got her locked up somewhere. No, of course not. The fact is, we can't find her. Isn't she at the hotel? No. Your wife left the hotel just after you did. Brenda left the... Where'd she go? To 96 Street Street. She... How do you know that? The real entrance to 96 is at the back... Up a flight of stairs, past the barber's window. One of our men saw her there, then lost her. You mean Morgan may have seen her before he came into the shop and, and attacked her? Uh, Mr. Leslie, 
You're the one who's got to take it easy. Just sit down, gentle like. Do you see now why you've got to give up this crazy story that you didn't kill Morgan and that you and Old Scratch were never out of each other's sight? But it's true. Don't you see what I want to know? Did Morgan kill your wife? I want to know whether there was any blood on the razor before you fought Morgan. This, as they say in the nursery books, is an office. That's a filing cabinet. You are smoking a pipe. I've got to hold on to things because they're getting blurred. Blast you, I never fought Morgan. Want to think it over for a while? Brenda's dead. That's what you're saying. Don't start to object. That's what you're intimating. And if Brenda's dead, on the course of it. Chief Inspector. Sergeant, keep out of here. I told you not to. Yes, sir, but I couldn't help it. She's here. She's been in the ante room listening to every word you've said. Who's here? Mrs. Leslie. She says she wants to give herself up. Bill! Bill! Please stay where you Brenda. are, Mrs. Leslie. You want to give yourself up? No. Not for murder. Oh, I'm so horribly frightened and mixed up. I don't know what I did say. But I had to talk to you. Because I saw the murder committed. You saw it from where? From outside the window, on the back stairs. Oh, Bill, darling, I got there before you did. You had to ask directions at the beginning. I... I saw you come in. Into the barbershop? Yes. But I think I'd have known what happened, even if I hadn't seen it. Are you one of our women detectives, Mrs. Leslie? Oh, please, Mr. Radford. It's because I am a woman that I'd have noticed. You're too used to it. Bill thinks that that man you call Old Scratch was never out of his sight for a moment. But he's forgotten something. Forgotten what? You've forgotten there were 30 seconds when you had a hot towel over your face and eyes. Sergeant, better grab our friend Scratch's arms. Quick. Keep away from me! Please! Got him safe, ma'am. Can I you? Oh. Go on, Mrs. Leslie. Well, he, he went to the cupboard. He opened the door only partly and, and slashed inside. He dropped the razor inside and came back with an oilskin pouch of money. He put the money under a trap in the cork floor. It took less than 30 seconds, if you timed it. <laughs> it's a pity I ain't got another razor. Old Scratch never misses with a razor. Better put the cuffs on him, Sergeant. You see, I already guessed he was an accomplice of Morgan's. You what? Oh, Bill, you're so adventurous you won't use common sense. He was reading an evening paper with pictures of Morgan and you too. But he said he'd never heard of Morgan... You spoke first, so he knew you were the American. And he saw a way of killing his partner, Morgan, for the money. If he just dropped that razor in the cupboard, the police would think it belonged to Morgan, wouldn't they? I'm afraid they would. Only I'm an awful coward. I was so paralyzed I couldn't even scream. Somebody chased me. Maybe it was the police. And I fainted in some old woman's room. I... Oh, Inspector, may I go to my husband now? You may, Mrs. Leslie. With the apologies of the CID. Bill, please take me away from London before your sense of adventure starts again. I don't understand these detective stories. And so, in rather a pleasant vein, I end my story of the husband who sought trouble and the wife who got him out of it. And as I, Dr. Fabian, ship surgeon of the Mauravania, sit here in my cabin, B-13, remembering this story, I wonder what other memories of strange and sinister happenings will come back as we touch at the other ports of our world cruise... I hope to greet you again next week in cabin B-13. Next week, as the Moravania docks at Cherbourg, Dr. Fabian will bring you from his cabin, B-13, a story in which he himself plays a small part. A tale with not quite so pleasant an ending as tonight's. A strange adventure which he calls The Man Who Couldn't Be Photographed. Cabin B-13 is created and written by John Dixon Carr, outstanding mystery novelist in both England and America, who is also famous as Carter Dixon. 
These Dr. Fabian stories are all newly written for you by Mr. Carr and have not appeared before on the air or in printed form. Dr. Fabian is played by Arnold Moss, and on tonight's drama, Joseph Curtin played Bill Leslie, with Naomi Campbell as Brenda, and William Podmore as Jenkins. The music is composed and conducted by Merle Kendrick. Cabin B-13 is edited by Charles S. Monroe, and the productions are directed by John Dietz. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Radio.